Hello, everybody. Welcome to the BCITSA Entrepreneurship First Virtual Panel. Today is our Marketing Ask an Expert panel, and I'm very pleased to announce our two awesome guests today. We have Emma Schramm and Richard Bergen, and we're going to be going through questions about marketing for entrepreneurs and startups. So, Emma, if you could just introduce yourself to start. Sure. So I currently work as a communications and marketing strategist at the BCIT Student Association, but I also have a heavy focus on digital and web graphic design. Um, I have experience working in nonprofit environments as well as startups. So working with very small budgets all of the time. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And Rich, over to you. Uh, hi there. So I'm the senior marketing manager with Destination British Columbia. Um, I've been working in marketing for around nine years or so now. Uh, I graduated from the BCIT marketing communications program um, and I went off to work for ad agencies in Vancouver for about five or so years after graduating. Spent a year working at an ad agency in New York. Um, at a, at a agency for based in Vancouver called Major Tom. Uh, upon coming back, started working with Destination BC. So work with a variety of clients in the agency world. And now my focus is mostly on tourism marketing and specifically ski marketing. Ski marketing. Nice. Ooh, nice. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for being here, panelists. I'm just going to kick it off with our first question. So for entrepreneurs, there's so many messages, stories, and photos that each business can share. How can they decide what makes a good story and what message to share? So let's start with Emma. Uh, sure. I mean, what makes your business unique and different really is you. So no matter how many stories and messages there are out there, whatever is most authentic to you and you think will connect the most with your consumers, I think is the best messaging to share. Um, connect it to your purpose, your overall mission and values. Consumers are very clever. <laughs> they're going to notice when your uh, stories are not personal or they're based on stock photos or they're just hollow in general. So I think just focus on what's most unique and different about you and it will translate into your product. So authenticity. Yeah. Is key. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Rich, I, to add. I was going to sort of say the same thing. I mean, you have the <laughs> idea of like authentic marketing, authentic communication. That's such a, a big thing. It's a, it's been a buzzword for a couple of years now, but I think it's, it's going to stick around that idea because it's so true. If you're not being authentic, if you're trying to persuade or convince someone of something that isn't true to yourself, of your brand, of your company, of your product or service, people are eventually going to see through that. So be authentic. Um, you know, and allow your personality, your company sort of to shine through in all of your communications. Um, but a lot of it will be context dependent. Um, you know, the, the type of story that works really well for one brand or one product or service won't work well for another. And even when it does work well, make sure you know what channel you're communicating it on. If you're writing, you know, a thousand word story and posting it onto Twitter, um, you've, you're, you're <laughs> missing something there. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to sort of share stories about puppy dogs and sunshine and rainbows and unicorns and putting it on LinkedIn, then something's not adding up. Uh, some of these are pretty obvious. Some of them you have to think about a bit more, but whatever stories and images you are going to share, I mean, first off, consider it like the term story. I love that you included that there. They all should be considered part of a story and it should be an authentic story shared in a way that the user who's connecting with it will be able to engage with it in a way that they're looking to be engaged with. Um, and if you can keep all that context in mind, then, you know, you'll probably hit the mark uh, most of the time. Yeah, and to add to that, actually, just speaking on content, it gets mm -hmm. exhausting creating content for all of your platforms. So I find it less exhausting if you are not making up stories that aren't authentic to yourself or your business. Whatever makes you excited is going to be a lot easier to create and portray to your audience versus just, you know, turning and turning out content that you don't care about, really. <laughs> right. So keep your heart in it. We're going to talk more about channels in a minute. Uh, so moving to the next question, for a lot of our listeners here are going to be bootstrapping entrepreneurs. They're just starting out. So can you share any tips for effective, low-cost marketing strategies? We're talking about people that they are not in a position to put a big budget towards marketing. So let's start with Rich. 
Um, so, I mean, first off, if you're going to be looking for low cost strategies, then you look for the low cost channels to be sort of active on. Um, I mean, you don't want to base your strategies around sort of what the free tool is. So don't be like, oh, I found this free tool. Okay, I'll do everything I can up around this free tool. Um, and a lot of times in this conversation, I might even mention Google Analytics a few times as being a really key piece of sort of your your marketing toolkit um, and you certainly do want to have such something like an analytics as a performance measurement sort of tool integrated into all the things you do but when you're looking for sort of an effective low cost marketing strategy I mean, in the end, look at sort of like, how can you communicate with your audience? Understand where your audience is, understand how they're looking to ingest information and find the sort of the low cost effective ways to communicate with them there. Um, maybe it's through a digital channel. Maybe you realize the most low cost way is to get out of your chair and in normal non-COVID times, go and meet people face to face because you're at uh, conferences and events. Um, maybe it's cold calling um your channel or your your strategy is going to really be dependent on who your audience is the product or service you're having to communicate and understanding how to find the people that you want to reach out to so um again don't let your tactics that are cheap and easy dictate what you do really make it build around your product your service and the audience you want to find so knowing who your customers are is key knowing oh where gosh. to find them. It, yeah. It's so key. I mean, interesting sort of thought, uh, like if all of your audience is based out of, let's say, Florida for some reason, and you're here in Vancouver, I mean, you're going to need to have a strategy that is built around communication with people in Florida. If your audience is dispersed globally and you can't pinpoint them geographically, you're going to need a strategy that allows you to communicate globally without being sort of pinned down to a certain spot. If all of your audience is based within a four block radius in Kitsilano, you need a strategy that is built around that idea of that floor block, four, floor, four block radius to be able to find <laughs> that audience. So know your audience, know how you want to connect with them, know how they want to be connected with. Um, you know, if you're trying to reach an audience that is sort of like their early risers, they're drinking coffee, maybe you got a fancy new sort of like, you know, high nutritional coffee product. Um, maybe you probably shouldn't be out sort of banging pots and pans at midnight, but instead you're out in the morning sort of reaching them when they're most susceptible to that coffee messaging. So again, know the audience, know how they consume information and know the right way that's going to connect with them and your strategy is going to evolve out of that. Perfect. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, I mean, agree with absolutely everything Rich just said, but just to add to that, I think also once you figure out your audience, maybe focus because you are just one person, you're probably running your company, doing a thousand other things, and don't feel like you have to be cold calling everyone and having an Instagram account that you're running, also running another three other accounts and also setting up events. Like maybe after you've really pinpoint where your audience is, like Rich was saying, focus in on one thing at a time because you can it can get very overwhelming, um, especially if you find that digital strategy is your success strategy mm. um it's just you know there's no need to join every single possible platform use those analytics that are usually free on those platforms that you're using in terms of social media and just find what works best for you and just focus yeah. on that because there's no point putting all that extra stress on yourself because it's not gonna add results anyways <laughs> that's right. sort of a good point if you're doing a bootstrap sort of enterprise you probably <laughs> should have a pretty simple strategy because if you're limited in resources, how can you possibly fund or sort of make a strategy that is complicated go forward? Keep it simple, you'll be much more successful. Better to do one or two things really well, I imagine, mm -hmm. than to do a whole bunch of things in a mediocre mediocre way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that brings me to our next question. You've both touched on this a little bit, but there's so many channels out there. I want to know more about how to evaluate them. So if we're looking at social media marketing channels, you know, if an entrepreneur is wondering, do I need a Facebook account, an Instagram account? Do I need to be on Snapchat? Should I be sending out a newsletter? How do you evaluate those channels? Just a little more detail on that. Uh, let's go back to Rich. Um, 
so I think a lot of times, again, it's going to come down to your audience. Um, that'll be the, the first sort of starting point. Um, you can do some basic research online to be like, OK, my audience looks like this demographic or this kind of segment. Um, who's on what social channel? Um, a lot of the times you're going to get some pretty sort of generic kind of answers. Um, you know, everyone is on Facebook, but it does skew a little bit more to some age demographics. Not everyone is on TikTok. Um, not everyone is on YouTube. Uh, some people spend a lot more time consuming content on different channels. So there's lots of free research you'll find online. Some of it is going to sort of be a bit contradictory, but you'll be able to find sort of what channels your audience is spending time on. Um, and next is what are what are you most suited for? So if you have a very like technical engineering -y type product, um, you know, maybe Twitter is a good spot for you. Maybe YouTube is, but like a sort of more fun, youthful, like Snapchat kind of space. Probably not. If you are going to be on a channel like YouTube, what is your function there? Are you in the entertainment space? Well, again, if you're more of a technical engineering product speaking to a very niche audience, you probably want a much more sort of information base. So how well does the channel work to communicate the kind of things that you want to communicate to your audience? Um, if you are the kind of product or service that is going to be very conversational, um, you're a lifestyle brand or something like that, then where do the lifestyle brands go? Where do you find you can have that sort of more two-way dialogue with your audiences? Um, at the end of the day, you can also look at what your competitor set is doing. Um, where are they active? Find the brands that you think best represent where you want to be in the future. Look at what they're doing. If you don't see any Facebook accounts, even if your audience is there, you're like, oh, okay, well, maybe I've missed something in my research and maybe I won't start there. Um, and then all of a sudden, it always comes back again to the idea of, you know, we're talking about bootstrap strategies here. Keep it simple. Find the channel, and I'll even go singular on this, find the one channel that is going to work the best for you and just focus on that one. Um, take your time, do your research, see what people are doing, and then just pick one and start there. Great starting point to find those competitors, which, you know, entrepreneurs are already doing through a competitive analysis and then get a baseline of what they're doing. Yeah. Um, one more thing I did want to add, I forgot about, um, you mentioned email and newsletters. Um, people who have communicated with you, um, people who have found you in the past are typically the most valuable people you have. So let's say, for example, you're like, okay, I'm just going to pick one channel and it's going to be Facebook or Instagram, or I'm just going to build a website and do really good SEO to bring people to me. Um, when people do engage with you, that's the one part where like, okay, you do have to have some kind of continuing conversation sort of strategy. So I love the idea when you mentioned email or newsletters, there's a lot to be said around building that. You could have a, a, an entire sort of strategy just around email communication or newsletter communication or re-engagement with your audience. So whatever you do end up following through with, make sure you don't lose those people who have said, hey, I'm interested in you. And you kind of forget about them to keep finding new people you want to keep talking to the people that have sort of raised their hand and said, hey, mm -hmm. I, I like what you're doing. Don't lose them. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Yeah, Emma. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing I would add to that is if you've done all that audience research and you can't find your customers online in any of the channels that you thought you were going to find them, that's OK. Maybe social media or newsletters, emails, it's not for you. And that's totally fine. Who cares if everyone else is on? that platform, if you have the most success reaching out to your personal contacts or cold calling or going to door to door pre COVID time, then keep doing that. Like there's no pressure to be where everyone else is if it's not going to work for you. Right. And a follow up question. I'll go back to Emma. Um, once we're looking at these different channels, uh, should entrepreneurs be taking a message and sharing the same thing on every channel or do they adapt depending on the channel? And if so, like, are there any suggestions for how to adapt based on the channel? Yeah, I mean, you should not be sharing the same message on, well, the same content on every single channel because people are there for different reasons and you have different demographics on each of those channels. For example, Instagram, TikTok, usually the age range skews a lot younger than Facebook, for example. Um, and I mean, the likelihood of, one person following you on every single one of those channels is very slim. So, I mean, maybe you share the same overall message, but you share it with a different medium. So maybe you share a video on YouTube talking about that certain message, but then you share a story on even medium 
uh, regarding that message. So you can have the same message, but using different mediums across different platforms because the people are there for those different reasons. And so understanding who the users are as well on each platform, yeah. so you can tailor that message to that audience. Exactly. Yeah, and if you're having issues, I mean, try out a whole bunch of different kinds of, that's the great thing about social media is you can test, you can try, and there's all the analytics right there for you to go back and look at to see what performed the best. So if you find right. your video performed the best out of um, the rest of the type of mediums that you tried out, then maybe try creating some more video content to see how the engagement rate works on all of those ones. So I think, yeah, just keep testing, keep trying and testing. focusing in on what works for you. Great. Yeah, Rich, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I like the testing bit because my initial thought is like, oh my God, never share the same thing on the same channel. But at the same <laughs> time, you, you do want to know what's going to perform and you won't have all the resources to share everything, all this, uh, like share something unique on every channel. Um, but at the same time, if you've got the same sort of piece of content, I mean, imagine it's sort of, imagine your different interactions that you have if you're going to meet your friends at work. Um, if you go out for drinks with your non-work friends, if you're hanging out with your, you know, intramural sports team, with your family, if you're at a child's birthday, if you're saying the same things at each of those different settings, mm -hmm. people are going to be scratching their head and wondering what's wrong with you. Um, you know, you cut, you tailor how you communicate with people based on the person you're talking to in real life. You should be doing the same in your marketing channels as well. Um, testing is great. You do want to know, like it's, it's not quite a second nature to, as it is talking with people. So test how things perform. Mm -hmm. But if you can't customize the thing that you're saying based on the different channels you're on and the different audiences you're speaking to, that means you're stretching yourself too thin and you need to sort of retrench and say, okay, where do I need to focus my efforts on to really have the best engagement and best interactions? Perfect. Okay, so another question that I get from lots of entrepreneurs has to do with timing and frequency. So we're talking about different messages to share and different channels to share them on. Is there a way for entrepreneurs to know how frequently they should post? You know, if you're sending out a newsletter, how often should that be? If you're posting on LinkedIn or Facebook, whatever it may be, um, is that through testing or how do entrepreneurs know how frequently they should get, be getting their message out? Uh, let's go to Emma. Sorry. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's different for every single industry and every single audience because based on your audience, I think what's more important than timing is consistency. Mm -hmm. So uh, social media specifically really favors consistency. So if you are committing to Instagram, just maybe you're saying, I'm going to post Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just keep posting Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay. Um, and track that and see if it works. But also think about your audiences on each of those channels in terms of timing. So if your audience is the classic, you know, nine to five um, employee, think about when they're on their coffee breaks and when they might be interested in reading your content. I was reading a article once that said, 10 a.m. on Tuesday is the perfect time to post mm. or to send out an email communication because they'll be on their coffee break and they'll, you know, be refreshed from the weekend and thinking about new opportunities. But for example, if your audience is the restaurant industry or, you know, security um, personnel, they're probably on a night shift. So they're probably sleeping at Tuesday on, at 10 a.m. They're probably, mm. you know, having a rest and not even wanting to think about work or anything involved with your company on Tuesday at 10 a.m. So I think it really depends on the audience of your channel in terms of timing, but there's not really a magic figure. I know certain social media uh, accounts, Facebook, for example, it'll give you its best guess based mm. on when your content performs the best, but sometimes it depends on the content and how topical it is. So, I mean, just keep testing, think about your audience in terms of timing, um, but, in my experience, there isn't any magic number, but maybe Rich has a different answer for that. <laughs> um, I was say, in terms of timing, I mean, I think this is the don't pull your hair out sweating about when to post your stuff. You'll figure it out over time. Um, don't waste any more energy trying to find the perfect time because that is not going to be the thing that sets you up for success in the long run. Um, frequency experiment and figure it out. Um, it's going to be different for everyone. Different platforms will call for different frequency to post. Um, the, the volume of content or the length of content. So for example, 
you know, you might tweet several times a day. If you're posting several articles on Medium a day, oh my gosh, why are you, are you even running a business? It sounds like you're just like writing stories mm -hmm. and putting them up online. So, you know, the platforms and different communication channels are going to dictate the frequency with which you do it. But consistency is the biggest thing. Um, again, if you're finding you're you're forgetting about one of your communication channels, neglecting it for some reason, then you shouldn't be on it. Um, you should be active. You should be paying attention to the people who are responding to you. You should be able to find a way to engage with those audiences and not ignoring them. And if you're able to do that, then whatever frequency you're doing, that's the right one. Perfect. Yeah, I think like Emma mentioned that article saying Tuesday at 10 a.m. I think everyone's read something like that where we kind of get the idea that there's a perfect time to post or a perfect the, number. I and I found a few different ones and they always say something slightly different. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. the only one I've seen sort of consistent is don't send emails on a Friday afternoon. But then, <laughs> you know, I'm in the travel space right now. And sometimes we're like, well, when are people daydreaming about the weekend? When are they thinking about their trips? And we started to rethink that one even as well. So like mm -hmm. the one hard and fast rule that I used to follow is the one that now I'm like, oh, well, that's maybe the one we should be breaking. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So there is no... There's no magic bullet. Like we said, it's like many of the other questions, it really boils down to who is your audience, yeah. knowing stop. what yeah, they're Stop worrying about hearing. timing right now. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Um, do you have any ways, any effective ways to get your audience to interact with your content? Uh, let's go to Rich. Uh, I mean, in the end, the people are going to interact with things that they find engaging, um, interesting. Um, you know, stimulating and whatever that is. I mean, what's the thing? You heard about how by adding in pictures of puppy dogs and kittens that right away things are more in engaging. Sure, throw in a, ki a cat and <laughs> then it's more engaging. But is that the right course of action? I don't know. It depends on your product or service. So ultimately, in the end, it comes back to the idea of are you being authentic? Are you being true to your brand? And yeah, you can do a few little sort of like cheat sort of here and there when they're appropriate as long as it's not being inauthentic um, but the best way to be engaging is to put out content that is worthy of being engaging what gets you excited it's your company it's your brand that you're developing what got you excited about it to begin with um, what are other brands that you see in the space that gets you excited about it uh, I'm assuming you're going to be someone who would have consumed your own sort of product or service that's why you got into the space um, when you look at other people doing that what is it that gets them the audience as well engaging there um, there are going to be ways in which you can position yourself to be a little bit more engaging I mean again the the, the kittens and puppy dogs is a, a silly way to describe it but it mm -hmm. is a way that sort of one way or another is is sort of effective. Um, don't do this, but you hear of people who are like, here's a picture of a puppy. Now read the 10 things about my product that are totally <laughs> unrelated to this. I mean, that's <laughs> terrible. Um, but at the same time, pictures of human faces are much more engaging than a bunch of copy. Uh, Facebook has rules around, you know, it has to have imagery taking up like 80 or 90% of the, of the image. And if there's too much writing, like written letters on the images you used, they'll not show it to as many people because they know it's going to be less mm -hmm. engaging. So, you know, take some consideration for the type of content that works in general for being engaging. For example, if you're writing a long story, how do you write a story that is sort of broken out in the right way that people will want to read it? You know, don't write a single block of text, break it up into paragraphs write in a way that is short and concise. Um, take your time and edit and proofread. Um, get a friend to read it and say what they liked about it. If you're going to post some images, you know, do some A-B testing. Um, here's an image of my product in this way. Here's an image of my product in a different way. Which one gets more engagement? Try writing a question. Try writing a statement. What, is, what gets people sort of responding better? Um, yeah, there's, there's so much testing around to it. Um, yeah. There's a lot of things you can learn online. Don't cheat be authentic and see what others are doing. Great. Yeah. So going back to the idea of testing, like Emma brought up earlier. So it's, it's great that online you have that ability to, to test pretty easily, but just by sharing different things and seeing how people engage. Oh. Yeah. Emma, anything to add to what Rich already said? Uh, not much. Just, yeah. If you're building an authentic community from the start, then engagement will follow really. Be authentic again. Maybe one more sort of thought on it is just that eventually at some point you will want to do something unique that is unique to you. 
that's how you separate yourself from sort of the rest of the crowd. Um, I had a, a marketing sort of uh, instructor once years ago that sort of everyone looks for the purple elephant or it was purple cow, I forget which. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it was the idea that something that stands out, you know, it's still an elephant. Everyone knows what it is and knows why it's there. But the purple one gets all the attention. Um, so, you know, don't jump right away to try to do something that's totally out of left field. Like really make sure you know your audience and how to communicate with them. And when you're ready, make sure that then it's you. It's still authentically you, but that it sort of stands out from the crowd a little bit. Um, and that that could be absolutely anything. I don't know what that's going to end up being, but you know, at some point, you can't just follow the crowd. Right. Find out what's different about yourself. That's yeah. See how you get the engagement there. Yeah, it's a good tip. Um, okay, so let's go over to more of the analytics side. How are people going to know? Uh, what's working. So what are the best ways to measure the success of your marketing efforts? Let's start with Emma. Yeah, I mean, it depends on your marketing effort, of course, but um, just ensuring that everything you are doing is measurable, not necessarily having goals, because sometimes when you're starting out and you're just trying out new tools, you don't really know what your goal is, um, mm -hmm. and you might be able to build that later on. But in terms of social, for example, we talked about um, each platform, for example, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, YouTube, they all have built in uh, insights, analytics that you have access to um, in your account. So on Instagram, make sure you have a business account or else you won't be able to see those analytics. That's free, mm -hmm. super easy to set up for your Facebook page. That all has a whole insight section you can look at there. Um, but also do some research on each of the analytics accounts um, on how to measure or not how to measure, sorry, how to read and see what's important because you're going to get a lot of data thrown at you and it's right. going to be overwhelming at first. And some of it matters more than some of the rest of it. Right. <laughs> so for example, if you're scared that you only have, you know, a few hundred followers or something, but your engagement's super high with those 300 followers, that's incredible. Use those free analytics. In terms of you have a website, Google Analytics, of course, that Rich was talking about earlier, set up your account with that. Um, there's there's so many tools, so I recommend just doing a lot of a lot of research. Maybe talk to a friend who has used the platforms before because they can be quite confusing when you're logging into them for the first time. <laughs> so just something to to prepare entrepreneurs for. You're going to get a lot of data there, but you don't yeah. necessarily need to interpret all of it. Exactly. Yeah. Just take your time to understand it a little bit at a time is my initial advice if you're just starting out for the first time. Yeah. Well, and awesome. I would sort of add on that a little bit is one of the hardest things to do for anyone at any stage of any game is what are the what measures are important to you? Mm -hmm. Like what is the thing that actually moves the needle in terms of how your business is performing? So um, years ago, people are always like, oh, I need to get more followers. I need to get more people who like my brand. Um, there are sort of like semi illegal companies that you can pay money to people in overseas areas that are just mm -hmm. online following, 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 follow. like that's what their job is, is to set up fake accounts to follow people mm -hmm. that used to be such uh, an incentive for people to get. And so the two things came out of that. One is they realized that followers are less valuable because half of them are fake. And then also, everyone realized, well, what is the value of a follower? Like, how do you generate a, a measure of the lifetime value of someone who follows your brand on Facebook or on Twitter? And it becomes a little bit sort of obscure and difficult to sort of quantify. So what actually is the right measure? Um, mm -hmm. At Destination BC, we put out a lot of content and we do put content like people who watch a video to a certain level of completion. We have decided that that is one of the best measures of success for us, mm. not because it actually, you know, moves the needle in any way or like we, it's not a cash register sort of checking in that someone has actually paid for a trip to British Columbia. But our organization doesn't actually sell anything. We have no saleable products. So we have to say, what is the way we've influenced someone the best possible way? And if we can show that someone has watched a video to completion or shared it with someone else, we're like, OK, that's a pretty good indication. If you're a brand that does have uh, e-commerce, that ha does have the ability to sell products at the end of the day, how useful is watching a video? How useful is clicking on an ad? Like mm -hmm. th 
it's an indication someone was engaged, but it's an indication that they're trying to do a further conversion action. So be aware of how valuable video views and likes are when really you're trying to sell product. Um, if you know that someone who watches a video is 75% more likely to, to buy from you, then that's good. You've got a bit more of a sort of like connection between the two actions, but don't just measure video views because you're like, oh, I think this is important. So great. <laughs> um, and then my other thought on it is, is um, knowing how to sort of put all the pieces together is really, really difficult. Um, each channel you're going to communicate on is going to have its own sort of proprietary measurement tool. And like Emma said, like you have to be familiar with them. You have to take the time to learn about how to sort of read through the data, analyze it, and gather a few insights from it. Um, if, for example, you are going to use a website for your company, then find a way to ingest the important parts of that data into your webs and your Google Analytics. Um, I love Google Analytics. I use it all the time. I couldn't be a stronger advocate of it. It's a free tool for you to be able to use, but your brand might not be on Google or might not have a website. You might be only selling products on Amazon or Etsy or eBay. Um, you might do only your only communication through Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Pinterest. Um, analytics might not be the right tool for you, or maybe it is, but it just doesn't work the same way it would for everyone else. So um, be familiar with the tools you're using. If you can find a way to unify that data in a tool like analytics, oh my gosh, spend the time and energy to do it now because it'll generate so many great insights down the road. Um, but know that each and every one of your businesses and your needs, it's going to be unique. So take the time, go slow, um, spend a lot of time de deciding what the problem is you're trying to solve before just going out and trying to solve it. Mm -hmm. I think one more thing to add too is just like you were saying about at Destination, how you measure success of your video by percentage watched and such. Um, social media isn't always a tool for your goal, isn't always going to be they found our product on Instagram and then they followed through and purchased the product through my website, for example. Social media isn't always going to give you that goal all the time. Your website isn't going to give you that goal mm -hmm. all the time. But that doesn't mean you weren't partly successful. It, that doesn't mean your Instagram isn't a successful tool for you. I know what you mean. Like these are, yeah. you know, you're trying to sell a product and you're selling it on Amazon, but you can't mm -hmm. just leave Amazon to function on its own. You still have yeah. some other marketing activities in other places understanding the relationship between the two it's yeah. so challenging to do but how do you set up some form of attribution how do you know that when someone does share a link on your facebook or respond to you on twitter like there's value in that and over time you're able to start to say oh okay someone reposted my stuff that means they're 20 percent more likely to do this kind of other action or i can start to put a dollar value behind it it's it's tough i mean nobody's come up with a magic formula um a lot of people try to sell you some snake oil saying they have um mm -hmm. but yours will be a unique situation where you're right um Instagram likes and Pinterest board shares and stuff like that will have real value that you shouldn't ignore just because it's difficult. Yeah. In conclusion, it's not easy. <laughs> no, which is why you focus on one or two channels and yeah. doing really well, because if you spread out, you'll never know what's going on. Yeah. Right. Yeah, especially for the those new startups. Um, OK, so just the reason why we're doing a virtual uh, panel here instead of in person is that there's a pandemic going on <laughs> and in case people weren't aware. So just one question specific to the pandemic, uh, since you both work in marketing, have either of you noticed any creative techniques, creative marketing strategies that uh, any companies have come up with uh, since COVID-19? Are people doing anything interesting that could give some of our entrepreneurs some ideas? Um, start with Rich. I mean, the easiest example for me is a destination VC. Um, so we, we've been running sort of a, a locally focused campaign, explore BC or hashtag explore BC, which is just basically encouraging people around the province to explore British Columbia since COVID's taken place. Um, it's now become explore BC dot, dot, dot later. Um, mm -hmm. and this is kind of the approach in all our communications now is like, you know, it, we're still here. The province is still amazing. All the benefits of sort of exploring British Columbia and getting that sort of unique experience and effect of being in the outdoors and seeing our you know British Columbian culture, they're still there. And we want you to experience it, but the world's not ready for it yet. And when it is, keep us top of mind. Um, and I think you get a lot of 
sort of different communications now where people are trying to be sympathetic to the, un, the, the plight that the world is in and being like, take care of yourself. You know, we're mm -hmm. here for when you are ready um, and we want you to uh, come and sort of like experience our brand and our product and our service in a way that is safe and a way that means that you're going to be able to sort of enjoy it and take the full benefit from it. So even more now, um, know that you're talking to human beings in a really unusual, uncertain, uh, scary time. And if you can't have a little bit of more empathy than normal, then you know, work on finding how you, I, you need to. You need to have mm -hmm. a little bit more empathy than you would have before. Yeah, so true. Absolutely. And I kind of, I don't really have a specific example, but I really love how a lot of marketing messaging has turned from I and my to we and us messaging because mm -hmm. it's so important empathy as rich was saying is the most important thing in marketing right now just to make sure that everyone knows that you are taking the issue seriously and you are there for the consumer when the world will be ready for it <laughs> so just all the communities rallying together under one cause it's i mean it's beautiful um i have seen some very confusing commercials where i'm like okay where's this going i'm kind of not sure what you're trying to do here and then at the end it's like sleep country and i was like <laughs> i had absolutely no idea that was what you were going for but i know you yeah. have to pull this commercial together probably in two weeks and you're trying to be empathetic but also ensure that a consumer knows that you're a mattress company that you you, you know please buy from me so right. <laughs> some of it's some of it's confusing um but i really love seeing how everyone has just come together under well, you know and again the authenticity is an important yeah. piece um yeah for <laughs> years i i like funny enough i'm in marketing and i don't watch enough advertising because I, I don't have television <laughs> um <laughs> but do uh <laughs> but um the, you see a lot of pushback each year around sort of pride week um whereby companies will just slap a rainbow flag on their logo and be like, we support everybody. And you're like, okay, you're just trying to sort of like get in on the, on the action, get it on the hype without actually doing anything meaningful, without actually sort of putting any sort of support and proper like authentic emotion and authentic empathy behind it. So don't just sort of, I don't know, I heard the term the other day, COVID wash, uh, mm -hmm. similar to greenwashing. Don't COVID wash your brand and be like, we care for you now, buy my product. Um, you know, it, it has to be meaningful or consumers will see through that. Absolutely. Back to authenticity again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I'm gonna wrap it up with two questions here. So. One is about hiring external firms. So a lot of entrepreneurs I know, and they're hearing all this stuff about marketing, especially if it's brand new to them, there might be some temptation to try to outsource. What would you recommend that new entrepreneurs know if they're thinking about hiring a marketing agency? Uh, let's go over to Rich since you're, you've been in that world for a long time. All right. So yeah, I worked at two different ad agencies. Um, one was sort of a, a subgroup for Cosset uh, agency based out of, I think, Montreal. Um, and then the other one was Major Tom, formerly known as Success. Um, I, think, I think agencies are an amazing partner to bring on to support you when the time is right. Um, you need to be sort of like laser focused in what you're doing you need to be able to communicate to the agency exactly what you want them to do, or you need to have a very well-defined problem that you need their help in solving. But if you just know that you need some help in your marketing and you're not sure what it is, and you want to throw a little bit of money at it to try to solve the problem, you're not going to solve the problem. You're just going to lose the money. Um, agencies are an expensive way to get help. Um, your, you know, hourly staff you think is bringing someone on board, consider what you might pay sort of a, a, a young professional or maybe even a very experienced professional bring on board. Usually with agencies, you're going to pay a bit of a premium to bring them on board for that. When you do, you often get a lot of like expertise and fancy tools and all this sort of stuff, but you don't get the focus and attention that you might need. Um, I generally would not recommend anyone starting out a new business of bringing on an agency partner. If you have experience with agencies or if you have sort of someone you've collaborated with or who knows your brand and product really well, then that could be a good opportunity. But generally, it's going to be one where you're going to have more misses than hits for the first little while. Mm -hmm. You really need to know 
what your brand is doing and how you want to sort of get from point A to point B, how you want to sort of drive yourself into that sort of next tier of success that you can communicate to an agency before you would bring someone on board. Um, when you do bring them on board, expect, I mean, expect the first potentially year of time to not be as effective as you want it to be. Um, with, when I joined Destination BC, we just onboarded a new agency. Um, now we're a big organization. We move slow, we're government. Um, so we're not a very good comparable to a small nimble sort of uh, uh, entrepreneur business. Um, it took two years before I feel like we really hit our stride with our agency. Again, we're talking million dollar budgets here on all fronts. Um, if you're a smaller group though, you're still gonna have a lot of lost time and energy while the two of you get to know each other. So be cautious, be very cautious, get to know them, really understand how they're gonna be able to help you out. Yeah, just to add to that too, so kind of in, in summary, figure out who you are and what you want your marketing to portray online first. And maybe even before you jump to the agency, even maybe consider hiring on a freelancer or someone right. someone more local who could meet up with you for a few hours a week. If you just maybe need help with content or mm -hmm. you just need some graphic design expertise, something smaller and maybe not a whole new strategy or a whole goal you wanna hit quite yet, but you just need a little more help with your presence online. There's a lot of opportunities of local professionals who are working for themselves or have time available for you to explain your brand and what you're looking for. Um, and then they can help you in maybe those smaller ways instead mm -hmm. of just jumping to that expensive <laughs> yeah, yeah. agency no, I could, route. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, having like freelancers or small time contractors sort of coming on to help you with specific tasks, they're still going to bring new ideas to the table. You're still going to gain a lot from them. Um, but when you're like, oh, I need to do graphic design for my website and I don't have that skill set, yeah, definitely bring someone on board for it. If you, I mean, again, I still think focus on one channel or focus on the mm -hmm. channels you can handle. But when you're at that point, you're like, okay, I need to be on Ravelry because I've got some fancy knitting sort of product that I'm doing, but mm -hmm. I don't have the skill set or the time to get on Ravelry. Okay, I'm going to get a community manager. I'm going to hire someone for four hours a week and I'll pay them sort of a wage that I know is a reasonable amount and they'll sort of do what I need to do on my Ravelry account. So yes, there's you definitely can outsource help, um, but no, you know, know what you're sort of purchasing with that help. Know that you're bringing mm -hmm. on the right level of resources that suits you, your business, and sort of the, the phase you're at in your growth period. Just to reiterate what you said at first about laser focus. So yeah. knowing exactly what you want before approaching somebody external yes. so that mm -hmm. they know how to help you. If you're um yeah if you don't know what you want then the actual the person you should be hiring is some like a, a business consultant um and if yeah. you're just starting out I mean yeah start go, go yeah you, you've got lots of resources there, yes. to, get to get you there yeah, yeah. there you go come <laughs> see us at the student association first exactly. absolutely uh, okay so I'm gonna wrap it up with one last question to tie in the BCIT education and uh, the marketing world so since you both studied marketing at BCIT. Curious, is there anything that you learned in school that turned out to be different in practice now that you're both working as marketing professionals? Uh, let's start with Emma. Sure. Well, I actually did not study marketing exactly. I have a diploma in web design and digital uh, development, and then I have a right. BBA. So more the you business. You marketing classes, right? I did a few of them, but I, I don't want to just anyone in my year would not remember me. <laughs> they were like, hey, the second year abroad. <laughs> so yeah, I'm more focused on the design and the digital uh, technical aspect of the overall business in my education. But um, things that were definitely uh, taught in school that turned out differently were any educational institution. It'll struggle to keep up with the actual pace of the industry so digital marketing for example is super fast paced algorithms are changing you know by month sometimes yeah. you know every every six months a year depending on what that social media um company decides to do so mm -hmm. you're kind of at the whim of the speed of the industry and you really need to keep up to date with it more than they teach you in school <laughs> Also, the four P's haven't really looked at those since I've been <laughs> oh, <laughs> from the textbook that you didn't have yeah, to do it again. Exactly. 
just getting dust on the shelf. But yeah, rich. <laughs> um, I actually, I'm gonna say that I thought I did my undergrad in economics at the University mm. of Calgary um, in the mid 2000s, early 2000s. So uh, I found that my undergrad, other than sort of fun dinner time drinks conversations, um, my undergrad degree never really helped me that much in the real world, at least not nothing too specific. Um, mm -hmm. You know, learning about backstop oil prices was certainly a fun thing to chat about at times, but I never used my undergrad in in a work situation. Uh, my BCIT degree. I've constantly been impressed at actually how practical it was, how very like skills focused it was on industry. So um, there's not a lot that I would want to say about how it didn't do a great job. Um, I, I totally agree that it can't keep up to date with the speed at which things move. So maybe I do want to touch on so the one aspect of that. Um, digital marketing platforms, uh, different measures, how useful they are, the nuances of what you can do. Um, I mean, I, I use Instagram at work, but I still am totally unfamiliar with Instagram's new buy now sort of features. And by new, yeah. I mean, it's like a year old and it's just right over my head. Um, keeping up with that stuff is so hard. Um, I, I taught digital marketing at BCIT uh, last semester. And I mm -hmm. still, even though I knew I'm like, okay, I am in the business and I would be teaching stuff and I'd be like, okay, I don't know how this works, but I know that it's important. <laughs> So I would have to be researching it the night before. And I was sure I was like, even looking it up a month later in the class, it was already sort of old news. Um, wow. I tried to talk about e-commerce and I'd worked with some e-commerce platforms, had set up sort of uh, advanced e-commerce in uh, Google Analytics. And then when I went, it, it had been a year since I'd done it, maybe, no, it'd been two and a half years and everything looked unfamiliar. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am already a dinosaur. And I, it's been two and a half years. Um, so I think that, you just have to know that the, the it's never going to be quite up to speed. But I think, honestly, I think BCIT does a really good job of mm -hmm. doing their best to keep it as relevant as possible. So I'm going to say, yeah, very good passing grade for them overall. Good. I'm glad it was practical. And yeah. you're both uh, stating the same thing, that it's hard to keep up with this field that evolves so rapidly. So yeah. that's and an yeah, important I, I guess. I think also though just like don't put pressure on yourself to keep up with every single possible update if something's working for you and you don't want to use the buy now feature don't use yeah. the buy now feature yeah. it's okay yeah. it'll come organically as you use them yeah exactly yeah. couldn't agree more amazing well thank you both so much for being part of our first virtual panel first ever and right. um, we were going to do this in person, but we are here virtually now, and we hope to one day get you both in person to a future event at BCIT, whenever that may be. But Amazing. it was really great to hear your thoughts on marketing. And for any BCIT students and alumni out there, we're going to keep producing content like this, featuring different experts in different industries. So looking forward to bringing more content to you. And thanks so much to Emma and Rich. Really appreciate you guys being here. Awesome. Thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah, it's been great. Okay. Hey.